Hey, Zoe, how are you? Good. Good. How are you? I'm great. I'm going to switch my speakers around so I'm not wearing these headphones tonight. Hang on a second here. Yeah, how are you? Things going okay? Zoe, are you there? Yes. There you are. I hear you now. What's going on? Nothing going on. Just. No. Kind of a nice relaxed week so far. Yeah. Good. Good. Just enjoy cold weather right now. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Yep. I'm going to get a glass of water. I'll be right back. Okay. All right. Hello there. Hello, Professor. How you doing there, Zane? Zane, sorry. Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, you know, good. Alive. Yeah, good. I'm glad you're feeling better today. It's, it's you know slowly up increasing. Good. Good. <laughs> see let me come around to my screen there yeah great so um hi hello hello marcellus hi elizabeth zoe hello. you guys all doing well this week hi. yes good 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 well hey um i'm not sure how many of us will will be in tonight um we'll uh why don't we get started and if you guys uh can bear with me i'm not feeling my top notch tonight 
we may end a little early, okay? Sorry, right, Professor. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's uh, let me, let's pick up. I'll uh, share my screen. So the last. Let's kind of just do a real quick recap of where we've been in the last few weeks. We've looked at creating negative messages and positive messages and you know the strategies behind each of those uh, and tonight we'll start uh, a present a, a conversation about creating reports and since you guys are doing one for the class um, uh, and at the end of the semester there'll be a, a little presentation from each of you guys um, I thought this would be a good chapter for us to get into tonight. You kind of a look ahead a little bit too. Have you guys done reports and presentations in school for other classes? Yeah, most definitely. Okay. Do you get nervous doing it or how do you feel doing it? <clears throat> nervous getting started, <laughs> but then as the ball gets rolling, get more confident. Good. <clears throat> Excuse me, I swallowed wrong. All right. So there's a couple of different kinds of reports and a couple of different strategies that we take when we're putting them together. <clears throat> the, the two basic reports that we'll look at tonight are information reports and another one called an analytical report. So in an information report, you're basically just stating facts. In an analytical report, you've done some analysis behind something, and oftentimes you're using that ana that analysis to be persuasive in uh, in a leadership role you have to take at work um, regarding a project or you know a business recommendation or or something like that. But there's been some analysis done behind it, so we take different strategies and we write in different styles for these two types of reports. And, and let's just think about what we talked about the last couple of weeks with uh, the negative and positive information or positive and negative letters and things we have, to, we have to write sometimes. In which of those two, the negative or the positive, did we say is more appropriate to write with a direct strategy? Positive? Yes, very good. Way to go, Elizabeth. Um, so that would mean that the negative report, we take an indirect. So there are a number of different kinds of reports. There's routine reports like status reports or um, maybe meeting minutes, uh, maybe updates about projects or work in progress and things that we create that we, that we do on a routine basis. A lot of times in the companies that we're working for, the projects that we're involved with go on for many months and the reporting behind it gets to be really routine after a while. There's a process that everybody gets used to and it's just sort of the way things end up getting done. Um, the reports help the people at the top of the organization understand the basics like they figure that they're paying everybody else to worry about the details because they're busy with their time thinking about long-term strategic things, directions for the company to be moving in in the future and things like that. And they figure that they've got the rest of us at work in place to worry about the day-to-day -day so that they can think about the big picture, okay? So these reports that we create from time to time are really helpful for the people who are working on the day-to-day -day running of the project, but they're gonna, and they're gonna need the most specific information. The, the executives at the top of the organization, um, they don't really care to know all of the minute detail. They'd rather just understand it from a perspective of, uh, you know, if there's anything wrong, let me know especially if we're gonna be late completing this project or if we're gonna overshoot our budgets. 
other than that, they just look at the report as sort of a confirmation that things are going okay. So when we get done writing these reports, we're either gonna present them orally in a meeting, kind of like what you and I are doing tonight, you guys, or we may share them digitally, like through email or slide decks or other things, okay? So um, let's, let's look at it a bit. The purpose is for the business report. One is to share the information so that everybody on the project, on the team who's involved in the day-to-day -day know all the details they need to know and everything is there in one place for them. So that's sharing information. Also, as a place where if upper management wants the detail, they can dig into the report to find it. It's there and available for them. That's the answering questions part. And three, it's to solve problems. Sometimes if you're working on a big project, part of what would be in that report would be a timeline with all the different moving parts in that project. And so if it comes up in a meeting that it looks like right now, the way things stand, we might be finishing this a month late. If management at the top says, we're not happy with that situation, you need to find a way to fix that and bring it in on budget on time. The timeline's right there and you can look at that timeline and say, okay, um, given the amount of resources that we have today and nothing else being added to the equation, we're going to be late and we can see that by the analysis we've done. However, if you, Mr. Big Honcho, top of the you know org chart guy, tell me that you can that you'll give me five more people to work on the project and more money to put against it, then we can probably bring it in on time. But if we're late and we don't have any more resources, and you're thinking that you might even pull some resources, <laughs> you can have one thing or you can have the other. You can have the budget or you can have it on time. But as of right now, you can't have both. So it's, so it becomes a management decision about what are we going to do next? And, and if we are going to, you know, based on priorities, whatever they might be, let's say timing is more important than money, then it opens up the conversation about, okay, well, what has to get added? You know, where, or, or where, can we, where can we cut to save money to still, you know, uh, bring it in uh, on budget or any other number of things? But that's what we mean by solving problems, okay? Just in a, in a nutshell. So what are the functions of these reports? Well, one is they provide information like I was just sharing with you. And then the other kind of a report is an analytical report as I was saying that there's those two types, information and, and analytical. So in an information report, it's data only. It's this happened and this happened and this happened and we've spent this much and this is our timeline and this is when we're gonna finish. But you're not there to provide recommendations. You're just strictly the scope of the report is what's happening. With an analytical report, the whole point of the report is to do particular types of analysis so that you can answer particular types of questions and draw some conclusions like if we're going to come in on time we're going to need to have five more people in three in, in three departments each and we're going to have to have so many more hundreds of thousands of dollars and we're going to have to work overtime and 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 the reason that you can provide that in, that information is because you've run it through your analysis. You've said, okay, you've kind of done what they call a what if or a situation analysis, which is basically what if we had more this or what if we had more that, what would the results be? And you basically just calculate through. Okay, uh, so those are report functions. Now the organizational strategy is if what you're providing is simply an information report, then you'll take a direct approach. If you have conclusions and recommendations that you're gonna to wanna to make, 
And that's really the purpose of your meeting is for you to deliver these recommendations. Then you do the analytical report because this is like the, talk, like the talk we had a few weeks ago where I said that the more prepared you are for any kind of an argument or not an argument, any kind of a request you might even have, the better off you are because you can lead the conversation the way that you wanna lead it because you've got the information, you know what the hot button issues are, you know which ones are safe to talk about. If you wanna get your listener all the way through the conversation with you before you bring up this controversial recommendation, it's better that they understand all the stuff that you know that's leading you to make the recommendation that you are. Okay, so that would be an analytical report. Are you guys, am I talking in circles or are you guys pretty clear with what I'm, with what I'm describing? Solid. Okay, so one at a time. Did, did you say Zane that you're, that you're a little bit uh, confused or are you feeling solid? No, solid. Solid, okay. And then uh, Paul, was that you too? No, it was me, I said clear. Okay, good, Marcellus, great. I wasn't sure who. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't me, but yes, it's clear. Okay, good, good, good. So let's look at an information report. This is where we're gonna present data with no analysis and no recommendations, right? This is just the point for point, you know, here it is, lay it out, direct approach. The routine, they're periodic. And we'll look at a couple of examples of information reports in a few minutes. In fact, here's the first one. This is um, a project report, okay, um, for Project SOV Unified Communications. The author is Jaina Gilford. The report date was November 2014, and it was period ending uh, end of October. So this is obviously a memo format. And any time that you're going to write a, a, a memo, it would have these four headings at the top. Um, and each of these sections in here, project summary, initiating high level deliverables, the overview, current periods accomplishments, next periods projected accomplishments. These sections of the report are always here. So the template doesn't change. What changes is what you're presenting in each of these things. And the reason that we create a template is so that the people who have to read these reports every month have an easy time doing it. If every time it was something different, because there's a lot of information here, it would take you a while just to kind of understand what it is you were looking at. Now, I've seen this document lots of times because I present this every semester. But for you guys looking at this right now, you're kind of thinking probably this looks like a little bit of a, a little bit of a confusing report. You know, it would take you some time probably to go through it and, and to understand what was here. I mean, that's how I felt the first time I saw it. OK, now what I want to make sure you guys are also clear about is this is just this one company's template. Every organization that you guys are gonna to go to work for in the future are gonna have different approaches to doing different things. And it's part of the company culture and the way the big boss likes it done. But in this case, this is their approach. And they call it a status report because it's presented, the same information is presented every month and it provides the basic status on the project. And it's all nice and right here in a summary way. So functions of, anal of analytical reports, they provide data or findings or analysis and conclusions. So this is different than the information report. The analytical report is getting the presenter in a position so that at the end of him presenting his facts and figures, he's gonna make some sort of a recommendation that some people in that group might think is a little bit audacious little bit risky. But if they've agreed with all the data that this person has presented, up until the time that he presents his conclusions or recommendations, 
it's very hard for anybody to shoot holes in it because they've agreed with everything that's been presented so far. So what's really nice about this then is that it kind of disarms your audience. It neutralizes a lot of argument that you might have otherwise, okay? So types of these reports, we'll come to in a minute. But um, the other thing about these analytical reports is it might also supply recommendations, as I said. And again, to persuade other people. So the types, a market analysis. Um, an example of a market analysis report could be like, you know, you might do, um, uh, a, re a company might do uh, a study of their industry. All the competitors, all the customers, is the industry growing? What are the new hot technologies in the industry? You know, how is price sensitivity in the industry? How are people promoting their products? Is there any, any new activity going on in the industry, et cetera? Okay, that could all be considered parts of a market analysis report. Another one could be a financial an analysis um, where you know, the head of finance sits down with up other people in upper management and he'll go through the balance sheet as it stands right now and the income statements and some cash flow statements and other things that tell the managers about the health of the organization from a profit and loss perspective and an asset utilization perspective and all the things that business people need to think about all the time so that they know that their companies are healthy. Or an operations analysis. An, a production manager could call his team together and they would talk about, you know, fill rates, um, you know, um, number of orders that were shipped complete, numbers of uh, people, you know, what the safety record was for the month or time out for, you know, uh, illness. Um, you know, they might be talking about big orders that are coming up over the next few weeks. They might be working on uh, uh, production forecasts, all kinds of things like that would fall underneath an operations analysis, okay? And a trends analysis, you could do in any of those functional areas in the company. Marketing might do a trend analysis to say, you know, um, we've been picking up uh, uh, year over year sales at about a 4% over prior year rate every month this year. But we see that that increase is going to now escalate because we've just landed a few new customers and we're gonna go from trending 4% ahead of last year to trending 15% ahead of last year. By the way, when marketing has that information, who do you think they need to share that with in the company? Other departmental areas. You guys have any guesses for me? Project department. I'm sorry, Zoe, say that again? Like a uh, uh, products department. Yeah, production, right? Production, yes. Yes, they're going to have to be. They're going to have to ramp up and be able to manufacture that inventory, or they're going to be shorting a lot of orders, and the customers are going to be unhappy. Who else needs to know about that? How about purchasing? The production can't produce anything if the purchasing department doesn't get the materials in and on time. And if they're going to need to be spending more of the company's money, then who else needs to know? Well, the finance people need to know. Operations is going to turn around and say, hey, if we're going to have to increase production that much, then we better get human resources working on getting us some more bodies in here. We need to hire more employees. So what I want to say is that all of these departments are doing trend analysis and they have to share them with each other all the time because the right hand has to know what the left hand is doing or things don't work out very well. 
So that's one of the reasons why we do these analytical reports is to make sure that in times where things are changing, everybody's prepared for the change as best they can be, and they've got plans in place to meet the new reality. So let's look at an example here. Can you guys see uh, the next page or do I need to uh, do anything on my side? Yeah, we can see it. Great, okay. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. So um, you got a sample market research and analysis report, okay? This is something that I would produce in my career, market research report. So the first thing that you see in here is some background information. Right? Why are we doing this study is basically what it says. And then they, then they give you the report outline. This is the market potential, meaning this is how much product the industry could purchase if everybody was maxing out. Then it gets into the operations side and marketing and sales. It gets into different types of products, adhesive customer profiles. It gets into one market in North America. And then it says, okay, what are the marketing priorities going to be? What are the segment challenges going to be, et cetera, et cetera. So they, so they divide this report up in a pretty detailed way. So this is the report outline. And when you guys go to write reports, you would do something very similar. You'd start pulling the information together that you had. But when you present it to a reader or you present it to a live audience, you want to present it in such a way that people can easily follow your presentation. So this number one review objectives is probably going to be a major section within the report. And then these are going to be subsections. So, you know, on a page, Maybe you would have the page, you know, set up where you're saying report objectives, big and bold here at the top. And then the first subsection would say market potential. And then you'd write all the stuff you have to say about market potential. And then you'd have the next subsection and it would be operational. And you'd cover everything you need to cover about operational and so on. So you would want to create your page with headings and subheads and bullets or numbers. The things that we've been talking about in prior weeks, this is where it begins to become important when we start putting together reports or other documents that are longer than just a memo or a letter. And we don't want to confuse people as we take them through all the information, OK? So this is like the first page, the research objectives. So this is a major section in the report. Now this would be a subsection here, right? So this could be like Roman numeral one for research objectives. And maybe primary is, you know, A on your outline. And then this is the first sub point under primary. So you've, again, you've treated it differently by adding this one and the parenthesis bracket here. So notice how big at the top the text is, real big and bold. And it says being big and bold and underlined like that, hey, everybody, this is a major topic in the report. We kind of get that. We get that intuitively. And then the next thing that we see here is, OK, this is going to be a subsection about research objectives. And this one is primary, our primary objectives, meaning our most important objectives. And then you get into the, 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 the detail. And because you want everybody to quickly be able to read through it and not have to dig through a dense paragraph, we've broken it up into numbered bullets. Probably in this case, why, would we, why did they use numbers, do you think? instead of bullet points? Um, that, that follow up the idea. Yeah. What was that, Elizabeth? To follow up the idea. 
Well, the, the, the mean subject? Well, yes, that's a very important point. But why wouldn't, why wouldn't I present two first? Why is two the second one? And why didn't they make it the first one? Because of the important importance. Yes. Very good. Yep, that's right. So when you guys write reports in the future, you're going to want to use this sort of a format. It makes it really easy for your reader or your audience to understand how you see the information relates to itself, how the different parts all add up in your mind. OK. So I'll keep rolling through. Questions to be answered by the research. Oh, so this is another section now. So my first thing was primary objectives. Then my, my next big section here is questions to be answered by the research. And it looks to me like this person sees a couple of different kinds of questions. I can see that without even reading it. This thing here, this operational questions, well, that's all these questions under here, I already know are gonna have something to do with operations. I haven't read them yet, but I know because that's how the report is arranged. Marketing questions, same thing, right? This is another subsection. And without reading these, I know, I intuit that these are all gonna pertain to marketing and so on and so forth, okay? Methodology, just the same thing. So we could go on and on and on through this and you would see this basic idea about how the report is structured, carried out throughout the entire report. Now, one thing that's really important is you can create whatever format system you like, whatever feels right for you. But once you've decided on a, on a way to do it, you have to stay consistent. If you change midway through, everybody who's reading your paper is gonna get confused. They're not gonna know why you changed it. Hey, before it was numbered points, but now they're just bullets. And are, now these are letters and not numbers. And, and oh my God, I'm so confused. So, so you wanna avoid that. Okay. So the direct strategy, right? This is the one that we use for, which one is it, you guys? Is it analytical or information? Information. Right on, Zoe. Okay. So when we, we use a direct strategy, when our readers are already pretty well informed about the project or the nature of, you know, the topic about what you're talking about, if they already are pretty up to speed, use a direct approach, especially if they're supportive. Or if you know that this audience really wants to hear the results first. Okay. So you kind of have to know your audience. If you know they're informed, if you know they're supportive, if you know they want the results first before all the detail, then follow this direct strategy. Do you ever? Very first week when we talked about the pre-writing phase, the writing phase, and the revision phase and editing, we said part of that pre-writing phase was analyzing your audience and knowing them as well as you possibly can. Now, when you see this, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you didn't have an inkling for how your audience is going to respond or how well they know the topic already, it might be difficult to choose the right approach. Let's say that you're talking to a group that you've been asked as a consultant, all of a sudden you're a consultant and you've been asked to go into a company and present on a topic that the company is struggling with, but you're an expert and they want you to go in and talk, but so you've never met these people before. Still important to have this audience analysis so that you keep your group with you. What do you suppose you ought to do? Any, any guesses?
you know one of the people anyway, the person who invited you to come and speak, the guy that's paid you, he contacted you. Do you think that person knows anything about the group? Yes. Okay. Yes. So what could you do? Um, talk to him about, ask him about who are the audience? Yes. That's right. You have to have somebody on the inside help you through some of these things so that your presentation is successful. They're paying you so that the, so that the presentation is successful. And they're going to be happy to share that information with you because to them, it's really important that it goes down right. So again, direct strategy. In this case, we've taken a, we've said we can use it for the information report and the analytical report. The, the analytical report we can do because our readers are supportive and there's nothing in here that they're gonna disagree with and they're informed and they want the results first, right? Usually an analytical report would be one that we would maybe wanna take an indirect strategy with because we're using it to win an argument or to avoid an argument. Now, with this indirect strategy, instead of being informed, your readers or your audience, you're gonna to have to do some education, okay? They, they're looking to you, you're the expert. They don't know, you do. So you're coming in there because of all your knowledge. Not only do they need to be educated, but when, if you were to dive right into your recommendations, you might get some really serious pushback because maybe it means that people are gonna have to wait to change the way things have been done in the past. And like we've talked about, people hate change because it's always worked for them so far and I don't wanna change what's not broken. And besides, what if I can't make that change? I don't wanna embarrass myself or worse, I don't wanna get in trouble. Or third, the audience could be disappointed or hostile instead of supportive, okay? So in this case, in order to at least minimize the amount of hostility or the amount of disappointment. When you present your facts and figures and everything first, and you're leading them toward the recommendations, recommendations that may not sound very popular, at least they understand the information the way you understand it. Sometimes it's easier to take bad news if you at least know why the bad news came out that way. Would you agree? You may not, you may not love it still, but, but, it's, but at least you know why, right? And so that's a little bit of a consolation. It leaves you with something to hang on to. Are you guys with me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. So we have this analytical report. All right, so there's an, two styles that we write in. One is this informal style and one is a formal style. Now, when I say informal, informal to a point, right? Meaning there's not gonna be any slang. There's no um, text abbreviations, nothing weird. Still business English but it's not as stiff or formal as this formal style. So it has a friendly, casual tone. And you'll hear the use of a lot of first person pronouns, I, we, things like that. Sentences are gonna be shorter. What was the rule we looked at a while back about the number of words you should have in a sentence. What's the optimal? Anybody remember? Eight. Uh, eight. Yeah, 
Eight. Yep. How about sentences in a paragraph? Eight. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Use conversational language, okay? So this is gonna come across, this report is gonna come across almost as if you were speaking to somebody, okay? Now, in a formal style, this is almost gonna sound like you were reading an encyclopedia or a really um, highbrow newspaper, like the Wall Street Journal or something, right? Very different from like LA Times or USA Today or something like that. The person who writes it is intentionally writing in this, they call it an elevated register. He's writing like that because he's trying to create a professional distance between the writer and the reader. Now, the person who's writing in an informal style is trying to be folksy. He's trying to come across as part of the team, like, like it was written as one of us, not, not a document that was being handed down from somebody higher up, okay? A lot of times, instead of this first person, I, we pronoun that I mentioned, you're going to have a third person. So instead of saying, you know, um, I performed this study last month, you might say the researcher has completed the assignment or the research within the last 30 days. So not I, but the researcher. And so you're taking on a passive voice. Remember the thing I said about active versus passive voice is that with the passive voice, we're trying to put the focus on what was done instead of who did it. So an example would be in, 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 in active voice would be John caught the baseball. In a passive voice, it would be the baseball was caught. This formal style isn't going to have any sense of humor to it or slang or editorializing or figures of speech. Over here under informal, it's conversational language. It's the same way you and I talk mainly all the time. Over here, it's going to sound on the formal side, it's going to sound like somebody's legal department put this document together. Or maybe human resources put this document together. Like somebody's trying to cover their ass with this one. So reports can now I also this is also important is that you can talk about having an informal style or a formal style. Usually. In most cases, what you find depends on the audience, but there might be some blending of the two things here so that it wouldn't be full on informal. It might be slightly more formal and only in rare, rare, rare cases would you get a report that was written in such a highbrow legalese kind of a way, okay? So let's look at some typical report formats and talk about the headings. But it'll help that I just showed you that other example, I think. So formats, you could send it, you know, you could create a, a letter format and maybe it, you take that letter and you uh, turn it into a PDF and then you email it someplace. Why do people like to send PDFs instead of Word documents, do you think? So no one can edit. Yeah. 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 You're putting a padlock around that thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, the memo. Very much like the letter. Okay. Only difference being is that sometimes the report is short enough where it can actually fit into the email itself without any attachments. A manuscript 
is going to be, you know, a full on long report printed out. It could go from, you know, tens of pages to hundreds of pages or longer. Pre-printed forms. I don't even know how many of these are still used in offices anymore. But um, back in the day, uh, when I was first going to work, they used to have these little message answer pads on, you know, administrative people's desks. There, this is still back in the day when we had secretaries at work. I haven't seen a secretary anywhere in, I don't even know how many years now. But anyway, um, they would, somebody would call for me and I shared a secretary with somebody else and she would answer the phone and take a message. And then the next time I went out into that part of the workspace and she saw me, she'd hand it to me or a couple of times, you know, a day, she'd bring him in for me to return the calls. This is also before we had um, voice message service on our phones. So this is going way back. This is at the very, very, very beginning of my career and it didn't last very long for me anyway. Okay, and then digital, right? A digital report is gonna be like a PowerPoint or it could be a spreadsheet on Excel or something, but it's not on paper like a manuscript. It's a digital file, zeros and ones, that's been attached to an email and sent that way. Okay, am I going the wrong way? Yeah, okay. So let's look at letter reports. I said you could also sometimes write a, write a, a report in the form of a letter. So in this case, this is coming from the Center for Consumers of Legal Services, dated September 17th, 2015, written by Miss Lisa Burgess, Lake Austin Homeowners Association in Austin, Texas. Now we can see the way that she's arranged this, right? We can see that in her mind, she was gonna have an introduction section. Then the next big section was gonna be determine the benefits your group needs. And obviously there are at least two bullet points in that section. One is about free consultation. The other one is about free document review. And it goes on. So she's, this is just first page of a multiple page report. So if what you've got though is a short informal report and it's gonna be sent to people on the outside of the company, using a letter report might be a good plan. In it, you organize the facts section into logical divisions identified by consistent headings. And that's what I was showing you here. Intro, determine, free consultation, free document review, right? And you can see that lower priority for free consultation and free document review versus determine the benefits, right? This, this is a more important or a bigger group. And these two things are subsets within this large group. This is the body of the report. Everything after this intro here, once we get into introduction and going forward, we're in the body. And it's a single space, the body. So if you look in this paragraph here, beginning with the word to and ending with the word plans, this is all single spaced. If there's a double space between the paragraphs and they're using this thing called the left justified margin here. Probably back in high school and before, they taught you guys about indenting the first line. And that's still true sometimes, but in business, we don't typically do that. And then leave one or two blank lines above each side heading. So right, notice that everything A, legal services thing, going down to free plans. These are two paragraphs, but there's a double space between this header 
And there's a double space between this header and the intro. The margins, they're about an inch to an inch and a quarter wide on the sides and a little bit less down here at the bottom, okay? Over here at the top, I'm gonna guess that this is probably an inch and a half maybe. If this is an inch and a quarter, maybe this is an inch and a half. And what did we call this over here? We mentioned this before. When the right side is not straight edged like the left side is, what is that called? That is not uh, justified, but I, I don't remember the word. Left, left justified? The left justified is, is what's happening on the left here. But I'm referring here to the right side of the page. Okay. We call that ragged. R-A-G-G-E-D. It's a ragged edge. If you have to keep going, you you know you do, right? Add a second page heading if necessary, consisting of the addressee's name, date, and page number. So if you were going to turn pages, you would still um, uh, include the addressee, you know, Miss Lisa Burgess. You'd still start it with her name here, and also the page number. You don't have to put her full address but you would put her name and the page number at the top of page two. Here's a, uh, another one. It's very similar to the other one we just saw, okay? So here's some tips. Use the memo format for short, meaning 10 or fewer pages, informal reports within an organization. Again, the side margins are an inch to an inch and a quarter, like we said before. Over here on the from line, do you guys notice it's pretty small, but to see the cursive letters CMR, they're in blue there? Yeah. That's her from Cynthia M. Rashid. So when you create a, a memo document like this, you're gonna to wanna to put your initials here next to your name in the from section. That's just another one of those format things you need to remember to do. Right there. Now, what you might also do is if this is gonna, if you write this and you're gonna send it out as an email, then you would you know use an attachment in the email to send it out. Back in the day, again, when I was first starting in my career, we didn't have email yet. What we had around our, uh, our company, and we were big, I mean, there was thousands of us, is we had a, a company mail department who spent all day long picking up you know, baskets of mail from people's offices, bringing them to a central mail area in the company, and then putting them on shuttle buses and driving them around town to the different buildings that we had. And they did this all day long, every day. Thank God for email, right? Okay, so tips for email and memo reports. We wanna chunk similar information into groups for quick comprehension. Chunking is, well, I'll give you a good example of chunking. Let's see, I'm going back to an earlier example. Uh, maybe if I do it like this, it'll be easier. Yeah, let's look at this. So everything that was in this section of this report had to do with the overview. And because they had a template like this, it was easy to remember to put anything connected with the overview in here. Okay, same wise with current period accomplishments or next periods, projected accomplishments. You wouldn't take some of this information like develop project charter draft, 
from the next period's accomplishments section and move it up under overview. It just wouldn't fit there. It would be very confusing to a reader to find that like that, okay? So when they say chunking, they're basically saying, look, assume that you don't have a template and what you're doing is writing a letter or a memo. Remember to still divide the information up into logical groups so that it's easier for people to understand what you're writing and what you're doing in your document and they won't get so lost so quick. That's chunking. And we also use concise headings to identify things. So like, look at this thing here on the left. Concise headings would be completed projects. And these three, four, five things, whatever they are, are considered to be completed projects. The next one would be work in progress. And there's, you know, six or seven things in here, right? So if I, if this person had just listed everything without putting any dividers in here, it wouldn't be so readily apparent that some of it was completed and some of it was work in project process and some of it was, you know, ongoing projects and whatever. But a lot of people in this company, when they get this, they it's important for them to know what they're looking at. So adding these little breaks, these headings, makes it really simple to scan the page, understand the layout, and now you know how to read the document and where you ought to be placing the majority of your time. Everybody's got different information needs. So PDFs, um, real popular because you can't futz with them, right? You can't change the content in there. And you, me, when I was writing contracts with clients back when I was running my company, I um, used to do this all the time, but when I would submit, I would always submit as a PDF file. At we, either the contract and especially the invoice, I didn't want some smart aleck to get my invoice and open up a Word document. Instead of it saying $1,000, it's $1.00. That wasn't gonna help me much. So slide presentations can be converted to video. Have you guys ever seen that done? There's a setting in PowerPoint where you can actually make, you can actually dictate a narrative right into the slide over your computer so that the narrative will play while the slide is going. And you can even put all of the different animations in the slide. You can record those to happen at certain times. And then the entire file with your voice, with the animations and everything comes across like you're watching a movie. It's pretty nice. So that's what they're referring to there. Slide decks are a condensed image rich format. We know this, not intended for verbal delivery. Yeah, what you, instead of, here's a good point to remember too. Um, I see this often with students who are just learning how to do presentations. They, they will sit there and, and read every word on the slide instead of talking to their audience. If we were all in a room together tonight, instead of having to be still in COVID land, you would see me standing in front of you making eye contact with all of you guys all night long. Okay, I would hardly ever be looking at my slides because I know my content well enough. And you're expected when you guys are in your careers to be able to do the same thing. They're paying you a lot of money to know the content on those slides because that content is your job. So if you had to sit there and read the slides because you couldn't talk from the top of your mind about it, you'd be showing everyone that you're probably not that good at what you do. And maybe there are other folks out there in the big world who would prefer the check that you're getting more than you do since you're not taking the time to learn your job yet. That's, that's how management often thinks about things like that. Not saying that's true for you guys. I'm just saying that's how the world looks at it. So we wanna to get to the point where these slides 
are not a crutch that we lean on because we don't know what to say next. They're more like just visual device that we use so that our audience knows where we are in the presentation. And some of the stuff on the slides, like pictures and charts and graphs and other things, help you tell your story because a picture says a thousand words. Okay. So when we create report headings like the ones we've seen, we want to write short and clear headings. Notice that the ones that we've seen so far, none of them are very long. Let's look back at this one for a minute. Findings and analysis. That's a whole heading. That's three words. Recommendations. Now, she could have said recommendations about the project and what I think everybody should do about it. And, and then she's off the page. But she didn't. She just said recommendations. Two, experiment with words that say who, what, when, where, why, and how. Why do you suppose that's important? You're presenting to an audience and their audience has hundreds of questions going through their minds as you're presenting what you've put together for them. Remember back to night one, when we were talking about the pre-writing phase and the writer, you, having to anticipate everything that your audience is gonna wanna ask a question about at some point in your presentation. And it's your job to be so complete that they don't have to ask, they, they don't have to ask questions at the end of the presentation because you've addressed everything. So when we, word, when we use words that hint at who, what, where, when, where, why, and how, I'm not saying these are the exact words, I'm saying what your, what the, that your bullets should get at these ideas. When you do this, you've anticipated your audience's information needs and you've built it into your presentation already. Third is include at least one heading per page, okay? Why do you suppose that is? No answers are wrong answers. Make it easier for readers to read? Yeah. At least get an idea of yeah, that's right, Paul. I mean, it's easier for them. It's easier for them to keep everything in their mind. If if your if your paper is so long in any one section, my gosh, that's a lot to retain. So by having at least one heading per page, you're intentionally condensing what you're giving people. And you're breaking it up for them. It's it's a little bit. There's a little bit less tension in a presentation like that. Okay, four. Try to create headings that are parallel. Do you guys remember when we talked about the uh, the the topic of parallel construction? Yeah. Okay. So we said parallel construction would be like. If I had, um, if I was uh, giving somebody instructions uh, in bullet form, and I and I was using two verbs that had an ing ending, like mixing, stirring, and pouring, in my recipe instructions, right? 
I would want to keep all three of those with that ing. If I said, you know, mixing and stirring and then to pour or please pour, all of a sudden I've broken up the rhythm of what I had going. People kind of were, you know, anticipating what that next thing should be. And then you tripped them up on it. You lose their attention or you confuse them. It just doesn't feel right. It's a little bit jarring. So keeping everything parallel like that keeps everybody working together, okay? So I've got, a, of course, another example for you here. So here's this coffee bar marketing plan. And in this case, this is the way that they've created their outline, mission, marketing objectives, financial objectives, target market, and notice that they've, you know, everything having to do with the marketing objectives is chunked and it's all in here and we're using bullets and each of these bullets begins with the word develop. So it's all parallel, it's all chunked and it's under this nice short two word heading. Okay, so that's kind of putting it into action for you guys to see. Okay, when you're creating this outline, which is really a hierarchy, right? Most important stuff up at the top, less important stuff as we go down. When we construct this hierarchy of heading levels using placement, size, and font, Okay, so placement, size, and font. So let's look at another example. So notice, um, this is the title, Food Services Marketing Plan. It's the biggest um, uh, font on the entire page. Then again, come to the executive summary, and this font is bigger than this, because this is only a sub section within executive summary, okay? You know, um, then, I, then they get into using um, pie charts. And remember, one of the things you wanna think about with pie charts and graphs and things like this is if it helps you tell your story, include it. If you're just adding it to add it and you don't have anything useful to do with it, leave it off, okay? It has to be something that's meaningful to your report if you're gonna include it there. All right. And then don't use more than three heading levels. In fact, we've got that here, all right? I've got, this is my first, this is my title of my whole document. That's my first heading level. Then I've got the section heading. Then I've got a subsection heading. And that's all I've got. This is one, two, three. Oh, that page is gone. Okay, well, it used to be there anyway. Whoops, how did I zip out of that? Sorry about that, guys. Okay, so levels on report headings. There's our title, just like the one we saw before about the food services marketing plan. And then the first level heading that we saw was called executive summary. And then we've got the second level, which is underneath the first. So on that other document we saw, it said executive summary. And here it said introduction. And then there was something else down here, et cetera. So you can see that they've broken this down. There's one, how many different, how many different levels are on this page? Four. Yep.
the title is using the biggest font in their whole plan. They're using a 14 point, they call this a sans serif font. This is French sans serif. And it mean, the word sans in French means without. And the word serif in French means tail. This, so there's no little tails. Look at like um, what all the words under first level heading. You see how all the letters have these little tips and hooks and swirly things, you know, at the at the at the edges of all the letters. They call those tails or serifs. And if you look back here at the word title, which is a without a tail kind of a font, there's none of that decoration going on in here. Okay. Now this is one of the things that I learned along the way. The reason that they came up with these little hooks and tails and swirly things is because it helps the reader see all these letters, one, two, three, four, five, T-I-T-L-E, as one word. The tips and hooks kind of bridge it all together, almost like cursive writing. So that was the thought anyway, when they came up with this a long time ago. When we get down to our first level, we're at a smaller point size. This was 14 here. We dropped two points here. And then again, we dropped two points here. What do you notice about each of these four different, I'm sorry, each of these three heading levels? The size? Uh, yeah, that's one. What else? They're all sans serif. So when you guys create documents in the future and you're creating sub and you're creating headings in your papers, your headings should use some sort of a font that doesn't have any hooks or tails on it. When you write the body, the, the actual text that goes underneath each of the headings, this should have tails on it. So Times New Roman, for instance, is a real common one. I think that's what this font is here, okay? And then how do we space it out on the page? Well, from the edge of the top to the first line of type, the title, there's two inches. You know, it's so easy these days to do this formatting. You just go, do you guys, have you guys seen how that's done in Word? Have you ever had to do it? Do you guys want me to show you how to do it? Sure. Okay. It's first I have to open Word. Um, applications. Word. Okay, here we go. This is one actually. Uh, I'll, cr um, I'll create a new document. Okay, and I need to move my gallery here with all you guys on it. And I need to move this. All right, so in here, you see where it says format? I think yes. it's here. It's, I'm looking for margins. Is it in here? Uh, uh, tools? It's the margins section. I haven't done this for a little bit, actually, to tell you the truth. Here, I was going to show you, and I'm a little bit struggling. With I think it. it's under layout or design. All right. Uh, let's, oh, I didn't want that. Okay, let's look at layout. Yeah, all right. Thank you, Paul. So uh, we'll open up margins, okay? And go to custom margins. So here, if, we're, if they're saying that you want a two inch margin at the top before the first line of type, 
you just two inches, just enter two inches in there. If they want two inches on the bottom, two inches in here again. They said an inch to an inch and a quarter. So let's go an inch and a quarter, 1.25 inches on both sides. Okay. Um, and that's all I need. So I'm good. Okay, so that's super easy. Be happy that you guys don't have to work with typewriters like we did when we first started doing things in school. Because you'd have to get out a ruler and measure off those two inches, an inch and a quarter, and make little tiny marks on your page, and then roll it through the, the roller at the top of the typewriter mechanically, and then roll it up just exactly to the two inch line. And then if you need to go another two inches, then you have to roll that thing a little bit more. I mean, it was all mechanical, it was all manual, and it was super easy to screw up. Sounds like a nightmare. Wow, that is a nightmare. Oh yeah. And then if you had to center something on a page, then you had to say, okay, well, if I'm gonna center it on the page, then I wanna I, you know, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna have a a, a word that's seven letters long. Those seven letters are going to be about two inches wide, but my page is about eight and a half inches wide. But then I got two and a half inches for margins. So I'm really down to six inches. But then I got that two inches for the word. So I got to take that those two inches and space them out between the six. And you get it? It, it all had to be prearranged. And then if you typoed, and you didn't have a uh, white paper or you didn't have a, a thing to erase it with, you had to take the sheet of paper out, throw it away and start from scratch. Aren't you wow. glad you didn't have to do this? Yeah. yeah. Super. <laughs> that was our life, man. No fun. Okay. So, I've shown you how to how to how the how it works in Word. Super. There is no oh, sorry. There's no sorry? There is no time for procrastination. No, there was no time for procrastination because you knew for sure that at least a few of those pages that had to be perfect when you turned them in were going to have typos, and you were going to end up retyping whole pages for sure. No fun. But it made us, when I, when I went to my uh, keyboard on my computer in college, finally, it sure made doing that easy, you know? Easiest thing in the world. Okay. So there were some advantages, you know? But like what, you, what doesn't kill you makes you better. Okay. Um, so we want to create this clear hierarchy of heading levels like we've talked about. We can use capital letters and underlining as part of our system. If it's a short report, like one or two pages, you only want one or two heading levels. I mean, if it's a short report, how, how, how far can you break the inf information down to begin with? You just don't have that much time to develop a topic where you would need more than one or two heading levels. And then it include at least one heading per report page, but don't end the page with a standalone heading, okay? Meaning that if you're coming down towards the bottom of the page and normally it would be time to set up your next thing, just leave yourself extra margin at the bottom of the page. You don't wanna just have a heading at the bottom floating there. Make sure that you do your punctuation properly. I mean, these are all things that you would do when, whether you're writing a report or a letter or, or anything that we're gonna talk about in this class. All of these things are important, right? But the punctuation, that goes, almost goes without saying. 
Keep your headings short. Remember the examples that we saw, they were two and three words long, right? Don't make them full on sentences. Just, you know, I wouldn't, don't go, try not to go much more than three or four words. Now we've got two kinds of headings. One is called a functional heading. The other one's called a talking heading. And I think you'll see why they're called what they are as soon as you got, start to see a few examples. Functional heading would be executive summary or introduction or findings or discussion, okay? So these are all functions within the report. There's a section of a report whose function it is to contain the executive summary. An introduction does, you know, includes some kinds of information. The findings, you get a lot more um, uh, detailed. And then in the discussion, you maybe start doing some what if analysis with it, or you manipulate it in other ways to show your audience other things that you considered, if you think it's important to show that. But they all have specific functions. Now let's look at what talking headings do. The first one, the best business laptop money can buy. Look how different this is compared to anything over here on the left side. So we know that the topic of this section is gonna be, you know, why this particular laptop is such a great value. But we gave it a heading that sounds more conversational. And that's totally fine and valid way to do this, okay? But it's a different approach. Tablet computers, displaced notebooks. So now maybe part of, you know, the, um, the report now is, is gonna start talking about why the market switched away from notebooks in favor of tablets. So they came up with this talking heading. Texting, the new smoking gun. And what's new in social media? So all of these sound almost like they could be sections within a, a popular magazine, right? Like it, it almost sounds like commercial writing kind of. Very legit way to write a report. Give me just a second, you guys. I need to check my time. Okay. We're going to go till 8.30, okay, you guys? Like Sounds I said, good. okay. And what I said was I was going to break early tonight because I'm not feeling great. But uh, you guys can, uh, I, I'm going to ask you guys to complete the chapter on your own, okay? And then, next, yeah. and then before I, in case I forget at the end of the night, we'll do chapter 10 next week. And then right after that, we've got uh, an exam for chapters six through 10. Same, same format as we had for the first exam. So it'll be online in Canvas. You go back to that quiz section and it'll be the same types of questions that you saw too. You guys all did really well the first time around and I'm pretty sure you will again, okay? Okay. So we've got functional headings and talking headings. And now there's a third thing called combination headings. Background, how Apple won. Personnel, the savvy workforce. So do you see they've kind of taken the best of both worlds in these. Production costs, the investment is paying off. Again, you can be, you know, and this, kind of is pretty creative way to do things. All three approaches are totally valid. It's kind of whatever you guys want to do when you write your reports, but you do need to have headings and subheadings. Determine the problem the report's addressing as well as the report's purpose 
and gather significant secondary and primary information. So here it goes right back to first night again, analyzing your audience's needs, and then going and collecting that information was also part of your pre-writing. So here we're in that phase, okay? We're, we're going about the process of gathering all the info that we're gonna need to write our report or deliver our presentation. And here's how we do this. We first think about what is the objective of your, of your presentation? Like, what are you really trying to accomplish? Are you trying to train people? Are you trying to sway people's opinion on something? Are you trying to get them to, you know, uh, put more effort in themselves? What? Two. What questions? What issues, what problems, what opportunities may your audience surface for you while you're presenting? Because you wanna make sure that as those things come up, you can address them. Even better, if they never have to ask the questions because you've been so thorough in the way you've laid it all out. Then you prepare a work plan. This work plan would be, you know, how are you going to gather your information? You know, if you have to have this project finished by a certain date, how much time do you think it's going to require for you to research and write it? But that's not all, folks, because you have to still go back and do the review and revision. How much time will you need for that? And then you back yourself up to, well, if all of that's true, and I need it done by this certain date, then I need to start it on a particular date also, or I'm not gonna be able to get things done in time comfortably and do a good job. That's what we mean by prepare a work plan. And the fourth point is get her done, go out and do the research. Number five. Organize, analyze, interpret, and illustrate the data. Well, you're gonna, hopefully, before you sit down and start writing your first draft, you're gonna have done all this first. This is really you planning your document, right? Doing the analysis, organizing it, thinking about what does it mean, all of that stuff is all the pre-work you have to do before you can write your document. Then you come up with your first draft. And then you finally edit, proofread, and evaluate. How much time should be spent, you guys, out of 100%, how much time should be spent with number seven? 50%. 50. Yeah, there you go. And by now, I'm sure you guys all have a real solid reason why it takes so much time because there's so much to think about. The strategy, the tone, the words, not just the typos and things, but you know, are there any remaining issues that I left outstanding? All of that stuff is stuff that you would be thinking about as you're proofreading and evaluating. Because then after you've done the proofread and evaluate, then you circle back around again and you do the edits, the actual writing stuff or correcting stuff. Like, I, you know, like we've seen this before, right? This is not new. So gathering information from primary and secondary sources. We've talked about this before too, but you can go, these things are secondary. Company records, these are files and things that the company created for some totally other purpose, but they might have a useful, you know, uh, they can maybe can pro provide some service for you while you're putting your report together. You can draw information from them. Could you go get printed material? Sure, like what? Like newspapers or trade journals or magazines or you know, internet stuff that you find, whatever. Internet really is printed, you know, if we, 
It's just that it's been digitized since it was written. Now we get to the electronic resources, which I was just talking about. We could, now when we get to observation, we're no longer doing secondary research. When we get to observation, we're actually out looking around at people or at processes or at something in the world and watching what happens when certain things come together. This is you actually doing research observation is. Okay, so this is primary. Secondary information, those things that we looked at before, is all information that was put together and collected from, for some other reason, not your reason, but some other reason, but the data is still useful to you. But when you start going out to do your own research, primary research, you're doing it for the specific fact of answering the question or questions you've got to fill in before you're done, okay? We typically use secondary sources much more often than we do primary because it's fast and it's cheap. When I have to start going out and observing uh, or when I have to start you know, doing experiments like test markets or <clears throat> interviewing people in focus groups or anything else, there's a big, big cost associated with all of that. Surveys is another expensive thing. Whether it's a mail survey or a phone survey or an internet survey, they're expensive and they're slow because you have to wait for people to complete it. And then once it's all done, in the old days, we used to have to hand calculate all the statistics that come from them. Now, thank God, when we do it online, the systems are already built so that the statistics are done immediately. As the data is being en entered, the statistics are always updating. So we can write short informal reports that describe routine tasks. For instance, if you take a trip you know, for your business, if your company sends you out on a work trip, when you come back, you need to write a summary of the trip. Why, where did you go? What were your objectives? Who did you meet with? What happened in those meetings? What is the follow-up that needs to occur after those meetings? Oh, or, or if you went to a conference. In that case, you know, where was the conference? Who hosted the conference? What was the conference about? Did you attend any special breakout sessions? What did you learn there? What are the applications of what you learned for the company? Who else should be finding out about this? I mean, so these are all the kinds of things that you would be including in those reports. And with that, you guys, I think I'm done for the evening. I hope you guys don't mind. No, Professor. Thank you. That's I hope, good. I hope you feel better. Thank you. I'm sure I will. Um, so uh, the homework is obviously all detailed out there in Canvas for the week. Um, we'll come back to chapter 10 and then have a, a, an exam after that. Um, so you guys have an awesome week. And as always, please feel free to reach out if you have anything come up you want me to know about. All right, Professor. Thank you so right, you much. Guys. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night. Have a good night, sir. Thank you. Take care.